before we get into anything, if you've heard my long-winded sidebars, you know more than anything, I believe in freedom. Freedom, to me, is having supreme control over oneself. Too often, too many believe that this idea comes with the caveat of suppressing, controlling, or marginalizing others. But again, to me, freedom is supreme control over oneself. Recently in these United States that I begrudgingly call home, it was leaked that our Supreme Court plans to overturn Roe v. Wade, a decision that has been standing since 1973 that guaranteed abortion rights nationwide for all people able to become pregnant. I'm not here to wade into any debate. I don't have anything to say that hasn't been said by more eloquent orators and fiery wordsmiths. But no, true freedom is supreme control over oneself. And anytime anyone takes any person's right to choose anything for themselves away from them, you are standing on your smallest toe on the tip of the sharpest blade. Anger is a natural response, and I ain't gonna tell anyone how to feel. As a man, I definitely won't tell anyone what to do. But no, I'll be wherever the people are. And with the people, there's always great power. You already know the rest. And now, on to the trivial in the wake of the madness. I'm not aiming to lose you, big mouth. I'm just gonna smash you into the middle of next week. Welcome back and welcome to Season 2, Episode 5 of Me and My Friend Pete, another Donuts and Dimes production. The podcast that explores all things THE Amazing Spider-Man. I'm your host, Peter Parker's persnickety pal, Gerald. If this is your first time with us, welcome. If it isn't, welcome three times and back once. This week, we're running through THE Amazing Spider-Man number 29, Never Step on a Scorpion. And if you've seen our episode title, you know the cost of insurance somewhere in the city is about to be on the rise. But that's not all. We've got the return of a rival for the Goldenrod Kid and the return of another for the Golden Liability. The latter being a man we've affectionately dubbed the man with the vicious right hand, the Scorpion. We've also got, may keeping secrets from Pete, and more vicious hooks thrown than the Blueprint versus Stillmatic. From the East River to the Hudson River, from flat ground to sky born. And we've got me. We've got you. We've got no further ado. We've got the amazing Spider-Man number 29. Never step on a scorpion. Me and my best friend Pete. Old adventures, new critiques. He spins webs, I spin yarns. Kind of kooky, be forewarned. Look out, it's me and my friend P. The cover. The cover of this masterpiece starts off with the title, The Amazing Spider-Man in Spidey Costume Red with Midnight Blue shading his name. All of this is written atop spider webs as usual. Beneath this, a white banner with green print reads, Whatever you do, wherever you go, never step on a scorpion. And beneath a sky blue negative space, we've got Spidey battling the scorpion in a body of water in a gorgeous bit of cover art. I failed to point out last episode that annual number two was the first appearance of the Spidey costume without his web wings, and this is the second. They'll be back in later issues, but the times, they are starting to change. Back to Spidey's left arm is above the water, above his head, wide open, his fingers splayed in pain. The rest of his body is beneath the pool in a dynamic pose, left leg straight, right bent. And his head? Oh, it's above the water, as well as snapped back from a vicious lash of Scorpion's tail, whose whole green-clad body, apart from the tail, is beneath the water, swimming towards our hero. The attention to detail, the water falling from Spidey's arm, streaking from Scorpion's tail, it's beautiful to look at. But this is just the appetizer. Let's eat. Let's get into it. The credits. When Academy Award time rolls around, leave us not forget. This issue was written and edited by smiling Stan Lee, with swinging Steve Ditko responsible for plotting and drawing, and sparkling Sam Rosen on letters and loafing. So yes, this is another S and S and S production. Page one opens to the sign of the spider next to the title of this issue. Never step on a scorpion. In a white screen caption box with red letters, we get an alternate title in a cream caption box beneath this. Or 
You think it's easy to dream up titles like this? And beneath that, we got action. Spidey, suited and booted, is barging into a room and the king of whip ain't come to quip. He is on his left foot, his right bent back, and with his left fist ready to follow up, is punching the scorpion in the face with a wrecking right hand. The scorpion's body is in a grimace and his tail, connected to his lower back, is smashing through a bookshelf towards Spider-Man. There are books flying, a destroyed table in the background, and in the foreground, in tan pants, olive loafers, sky blue socks, a white shirt, and a pink sequin tie, none other than the miserable magnate, J. Jonah Jameson Jr. But he's not tirading. He's bracing against the blue sheer wall, the spot just above his Reed Richards, missing a huge chunk. His left hand to his head, his right bracing against the wall, and terror, terror, etched into every wrinkle on his face as he watches Spidey and Scorpy do battle. I'm guessing we're going to have a slugfest. We turn the page. Page two opens with a caption box. Even the world's most amazing superhero can't wear a costume all the time. Dot, dot, dot. And we see Peter Parker in his room in front of his lab kit getting dressed. He's got his SJBs on. He's got on a white t-shirt and he's putting on a white button up. He's got a bookshelf in the background, a mirror above a bureau, a desk lamp behind him, and the Goldenrod kids all about fashion right now. He just graduated high school and he's talking about changes as he rolls up his sleeves. Hmm, last year's clothes are getting too tight on me. I must have put on some weight. I better invest in some new duds. The Goldenrod kids put on some weight. Eating good and he's brolic. He throws on a Goldenrod Parker vest, switching things up, no blazer for him in this one, and he heads down to the bank in the next panel to make a withdrawal, thinking the amounts practically cleaned him out and he better not spend it too fast. Cash in hand, he decides the stores are too crowded and he can go shopping later. Right now, he's going to see his girl Friday since he's in the neighborhood. But an event is taking place across town which will delay Peter Parker's shopping tour for quite a while, as some iron bars are ripped out of a jailhouse window. Dot... Dot. Exclamation point! We get an angular shot of a prison's front windows as a green hand rips the bars from a side window and a voice inside screams. It won't be long now! Before the scorpion leaps from the prison into the next panel screaming. I warned them, but they laughed at me. I told them no jail could hold the scorpion. He hits the edge of a low prison rooftop, bounces off and lands beside a tree, shouting that by the time the guards realize he's gone, he'll be too far away for them to do anything about it. I do not understand why every time these dudes are making prison breaks, they have to shout at the top of their lungs. Do they not know what stealth is? Do they not know what escape is? Have they never seen escape from Alcatraz? Clint Eastwood and the gang didn't go around screaming. They were quiet as church mice. Back to racing through a nearby forest with Clint's fist and wild eyes. Scorpion is monologuing something fierce. After they captured me, I outsmarted them by pretending to crack up. They returned my costume to me in order to calm me down. I had all this time to repair it and wait for the right time to break out. Now, nothing can save Jameson and Spider-Man from the vengeance I've planned for them. The man said he played cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, fixed the suit, and now he wants vengeance. Meanwhile, unaware that one of the strongest, most dangerous menaces of all time is heading his way, J. Jonah Jameson goes about his business as publisher of the famous New York Bugle. Dot, dot, dot. We're at 39th Street, 2nd Avenue, Midtown, Limestone Building. You can't miss it. And we get Jameson, busy man that he is in a white shirt and stylish pink tie with silver clip. He's talking to Foswell, who's wearing a maroon fedora, matching bow tie and gray blazer. Jameson's holding fact sheets in his hands and asking Foswell if there's any new news about the cat burglar who's been running around or the theft of scientific equipment. And Foswell, mobbed up as he is, former big man, current patch, hasn't heard anything. He says as much, says this is the quiet before the storm. Pete, strolling through the bullpen and eavesdropping as he's wont to do, thinks this sounds interesting, but he's going to ask JJ about it later. He'll be glad to tell me so that I'll go out and get some new photos for him. Staring over his shoulder at JJ, Pete thinks, as he often does, what JJ would think if he ever found out that the kid from Forest Hills, Queens was the property damaging king of swing, golden liability. Pete puts the thought out of his mind as he turns a corner and spots the one and only Betty Brant in a pink cashmere sweater. Her bob, flawless. Betty's all smiles and Pete's thinking it's the first time he's seen her this happy in a long time. But to be fair, it's the first time he's seen her in a long time. And Pete's right. 
The last time he saw Betty was back in ASM number 26. The man in the crime master's mask. Or the emperor's new clothes. Here on me and my friend Pete. But in that issue, they never spoke. The last time they did trade words, issue 25. Captured by J. Jonah Jameson. Or the Kavorka Chronicles. Here on me and my friend Pete. None of those words then were friendly. Either way, she's smiling now, and Pete, neurotic as they come, wonders what the smile on her face is about as she says, You must tell me more about it. Pete turns the corner and is shocked immediately. I wonder who she is. Holy smoke! It's that reporter she has a crush on. Ned Leeds. He's back from Europe. And the blonde-haired, green-suited, orange-tied Ned Leeds is back like he never left. The demon reporter is over UN peace conferences and back to sweep the damsel, never in distress, off her feet. He waves hello to Parker, saying long time no see, as Betty chimes in. Isn't it wonderful, Peter? Ned's back to stay. He finished his European assignment. He thinks, yeah, yeah just wonderful. wonderful. But he's not feeling this wonder at all. Meanwhile, Betty is just drinking in the sight of Nettie, saying that the man didn't even tell her he was coming because he wanted to surprise her and asked Pete how sweet that was. Pete says maybe Ned was too cheap to send a postage stamp. Salty. But Ned's not. He says he always told Betty that Kid Quip had a great sense of humor. But then, suddenly, dot, dot, dot. Joe, the police officer, comes racing into the Daily Bugle, shouting that he needs to see Jameson right away. All heads turn as JJ looks over his shoulder, shouting, Now look, officer, I put a dime in the parking meter. I can prove it. And Joe replies, It's nothing to do with parking this time. This millionaire paper magnate has beef with the 616's NYPD for refusing to put dimes in the parking meters. The man's made all the donuts and he still won't part with dimes. On 4, Joe tells JJ that the Scorpions escaped and the chief of police sent him over to ask the miserable magnate. What a word, ask. Ask. Back to. To ask the miserable magnate if he wanted police protection because the Scorpion spent his whole bit in prison threatening JJ's life. JJ is shocked. He asks why the man would threaten him and immediately starts flop sweating. As Pete, Betty, and Ned look on from behind them, JJ pulls a cigar from his mouth thinking, I can't ever let anyone suspect that I'm the one who's responsible for the Scorpion's creation. But he says, you must be mistaken. He's got no reason to, to, to bother me. I don't need police protection. <laughs> Not at all. Nobody believes him though. The man's cigar hand is trembling like a leaf in a hurricane. In the next panel, Joe ain't taking any chances. He tells JJ he's sending some extra men to watch his back. And you know, like I know, that's Tomas, that's Mike and Ike, that's Bobby Blackman, the 616's supervillain task force, and they're itching for Scorpion to make his move. JJ tells the police officer fine, but he's sure the Scorpion isn't interested in him. Pete, his face in a red glow, his eyes yellow, ain't buying it. He's bluffing. I can sense his voice shaking. And just my luck. I'm the only one who can stop the scorpion. Great power. You already know the rest. Pete begins to make tracks, and Ned, trying to get his hit back for the stamp comment Pete threw at him, says, Leaving so soon, Parker? Don't tell me you're scared of the scorpion. Pete says, All right, I won't tell you, and turns to Betty, asking her if she can have dinner with him tomorrow night. Betty, hands to chin level collarbone, says she can't, that Ned's taking her to see Golden Boy tomorrow. Golden Boy was a 1939 movie based off of a play of the same name about a savant violinist in money troubles who turns to boxing to make money. Turns out the kid was a savant with the hands team too though and has to deal with the struggle of being gifted in the ring when all he really wants is to play his strings. We've got gangsters, we've got gorgeous love interests, we've got betrayals and double crosses, we've got brawls for it all. And I gotta say, this sounds like Pete and his burden. Genius level scientist, but blessed with the gifts of lefty and righty that he swings because he has to. If Betty wants to see the golden boy so bad, she should just follow the golden rock kid. You sound bitter. I picked a side. Back to. Pete thinks, well, well goody for you. you. And waving Betty goodbye without looking at her, tells her to have a ball, that he'll be seeing her later. Betty says goodbye, and they both look upset. Meanwhile, alone in his office, the mask of cheerfulness falls from J. Jonah Jameson with a sickening thud. Dot, dot, dot. Exclamation point. Jameson is pacing back and forth through a cloud of cigar smoke with his hands clasped behind his back and he is going through it. He's thinking Scorpy tried to finish him off months ago, but Spider-Man was there to save his life, and now he, Jameson, will have to think of something. Hand to a sweating forehead in the final panel, he thinks, Spider-Man defeated him last time. If only he'd go after him again now. But that mask was is my worst enemy. 
He'd never do anything to help me. I couldn't ask him. First, your worst enemy is the guy over at the Daily Globe. You and Spidey are not enemies. And second, look at that false pride. JJ would rather have Scorpion take his head off than be indebted to the Web Slinger. I said way back in an earlier episode that real pride is always admitting you need help when you truly do, not refusing it because you don't want to look bad or feel indebted. Spider-Man saved JJ's life without batting an eyelash on multiple occasions already, and the man still can't bring himself to ask for the webhead's help. I knew a guy who was something of a philosopher, and he would always spout these strange sayings that would screw my brain over. We'll call them Romeisms. And one of this man's favorite Romeisms was, Fear is known to kill man quicker than bullets. I'll let you mull that over. On five, still sweating, JJ thinks there has to be a way to trick Spider-Man into helping him, and he thinks he knows what that is. He hits his intercom button and tells Miss Brant to call the press room because he's putting out an extra, thinking that he doesn't have a minute to lose because Scorpion can attack at any moment. And if my plan doesn't work, I'm doomed. Doomed by the, by the very creature I myself unthinkingly helped to create. But even as the desperate publisher conspires to make Spider-Man come to his aid, the world's most amazing adventurer is already attempting to do that very thing. Dot, 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 exclamation point. Spidey's gonna do that little thing. Suited and booted, both hands gripping a web line, a water tower behind him stage right, the East River in the distance, because it's always the East River. Spidey's racing around Manhattan, but he's not on the prowl, and he's not talking, he's thinking. Instead of trying to find the scorpion, I'll let him find me. It'll be easier this way. I'll simply show myself swinging through the city until he attacks. Just a fun-loving teenage charmer. That's me. And Spidey's going to play five of the Golden Liability Playbook. Like any good spider, you spin the web and wait. He thinks he's going to confine himself to one area, that Scorpion is going to hear Spidey's there, and he'll come running for the rematch. As people look up in shock, Spidey web swings above them thinking that if Scorpion's as tough to beat as last time, he should have his head examined. But Spidey knows a peace psychiatrist isn't what he needs right now. Web swinging onto page six, he's thinking, but I'll never make it to the superhero's Hall of Fame by hiding under the bed. The young web Spinner has dreams of Cooperstown, and he knows like I do that you gotta be a little bit crazy to think you have a shot. While he's looking towards the future and the street below, we get a crowd reaction shot of seven people staring up in amazement. A white guy in a golden rod suit, gray fedora, wonders aloud what Spidey's swinging around here for. A black guy in a maroon suit and SJB fedora says he doesn't know, but is getting on his nerves. And a redhead in a tan jacket and newsy cap is sick of Spidey. He screams, if you ask me, he's a professional nut. What he says, a nut. While just around the corner, we find dot, dot, dot. Cosmic and comic timing, of course, puts the scorpion on the ledge of a low roof, watching as Spidey web swings past from around the corner. Scorpion thinks Spidey is so considerate, drawing attention away from him like this. Bracing on the wall, sneering, he continues his internal monologue, thinking since Spider-Man's here, his other victim is unprotected, so he's gonna knock JJ off first and then finish Spidey off in a grand finale. Thus, though he doesn't suspect it at the time, Spidey's plan actually backfires against him, dot, dot, dot. Scorpion scales the wall with his pincer fingers easily in the next panel, embracing his large tail against the side of the building in a tight coil, springs from the building easily, digging his fingers into the sheer wall of the building adjacent, thinking moving like this is as fast as flying. Even as the scorpion gets closer to his intended victim, Jonah Jameson's extra edition hits the street with screaming headlines. Dot, 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 exclamation point. And we find a crowd gathered on the street, a pair of hands gripping a daily bugle that has pictures of Spidey and Scorpion plastered on the front page. The headline reads, Spider-Man and Scorpion are partners, says publishers. So Jameson found a way to gold Spidey into taking on the Scorpion. He's going to use the bugle, as he often does, to say Spidey's in cahoots with Scorpy. The front page goes on to call both men menaces who've terrorized the fearless foe of all lawbreakers, J. Jonah Jameson, in the past. The fearless foe of all lawbreakers. This man is in denial. Finally, we get a quote from J.J. If Spider-Man isn't Scorpion's partner, let him catch the Scorpion. A guy in the crowd says, imagine if J.J. is right. If Spidey and Scorpion really have teamed up, whoo boy, he literally says, whoo boy a blonde guy says the only way spidey can prove he isn't working with the scorpion is by taking on the man again so no matter what our hero does he constantly has to prove himself to the people of new york over and over because of these sensationalized headlines put out 
by the Daily Bugle. But high above the news reading public, the newsmaking adventurer begins to grow restless. Dot, 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 exclamation point. Spidey's still web swinging above the city, releasing a web line as he flits through a water tower base, and he's thinking something's wrong. He knows the man with the vicious right hand isn't afraid, but doesn't understand why he hasn't come after him by now. Spidey thinks, leaping buildings in a seagull bound, that there's no way it would take the scorpion this long to reach him at the speed the man travels. Unless... Resting on the sheer wall of a building, he realizes that he may be giving the scorpion exactly what he wants. While I'm waltzing around up here, Jameson is alone in his office, and the scorpion probably knows it. And Spidey's not wrong. And directly across town, even as Spidey collects his thoughts, dot, dot, dot. Scorpion has wasted no time. He's crawling through the window of the staircase in the Daily Bugle that Spidey and Vulture did battle in way back in ASM number 7. Return of the Vulture. Or One Man's Trash. Here on Me and My Friend Pete. Scorpion's thinking as soon as he climbs the staircase in front of him, he'll be right outside JJ's private office. And if you're wondering how Scorpion has such intimate knowledge about JJ's private office, back when he was just known as Gargan, stalker extraordinaire, he came here often to give JJ updates on Spider-Man's alter ego, Peter Parker. We turn the page and we're on... The Infinity, the Infinity, Infinity, Infinity page. page. Page 8. Just in time to witness Scorpion pushing the back door to Jameson's office open as the miserable magnate stands in the foreground, cigar in mouth, reading his own headline. This headline doesn't make Spider-Man attack the Scorpion? Nothing will. If only that web-headed costume clown sees it in time. As Scorpion pushes the door wide, JJ feels the breeze immediately, saying it's funny he thought he felt a draft behind him. Scorpion replies, his tail curled up at his shoulder. If it's so funny, Jameson, why don't I hear you laughing? Jameson spins, his head wrapped in a red negative space, wondering who said that. And Scorpion's like, of course it's me. I told you I'd get you someday, and punches the clock right away, shouting that this time, there'll be no Spider-Man to save him. He swings his battering ramp of a tail, obliterating Jameson's oak desk. JJ, his hands up, eyes wide and shocked, screams for Scorpion to stay back and bolts through the front door of his office, screaming. He's stronger than ever. He's like a madman, smashing my office with that powerful tail of his. Help! Somebody help me! He's here! And now, JJ is racing past employees in the Daily Bugle bullpen, Scorpion hot on his tail, shouting that his death is inevitable and smashing everything in his path with his battering ram of a tail as JJ screams for help, wondering why nobody stops the man with the vicious right hand. But there ain't no hero in this bullpen. Everybody's booking it. One guy from off panel shouts, Sorry, Mr. Jameson, that's not part of our contract. Translation? You couldn't pay me enough for him to slay me. Jameson, backed into a corner beside a filing cabinet stage left in the final panel, is a sitting duck as Scorpion bears down on him, shouting that there's nowhere to run, so they should just get this over with as soon as possible. But Jameson's not going down without one final plea being copped. He screams, No, wait, let's talk it over. Huh. Haste makes waste. Man said haste makes waste. The only waste is going to be Jameson's corpse in about 2.2 seconds flat. But at that very instant, dot, dot, dot. With Betty stage left and wide-eyed wonder, Spidey, legs bent behind him, gripping a web line with his left hand, swings through a bullpen window onto page 9, shouting, Okay, Fearless, you can stop shaking now. Your large economy-sized web spinner is here. In glorious living color. The... Technicolor Kid is in the building. Scorpion shouts for Jameson not to go away because this is just a temporary respite. As Spidey lands on a wooden desk and leaps from it towards <gasps> the man with the vicious right hand, both his arms wide, and we've got action. In a gorgeous, beautiful, dazzling, stunning long horizontal with Jameson screaming for Spidey to let Scorpion have it, Spidey sends Scorpion sprawling with a wicked left hand screaming. Hey, prune face, when I need a cheerleader, I'll let you know. As for you, Scorpy, we just gotta rid you of your deep-rooted hostility complex. Translation, we ain't friends, JJ. And fist, swing them if you got them. Scorpion's jaw, neck, arms, legs, all facing north. The worst position you wanna be in, in a fight. But Scorpion ain't a man who can't take a punch. Calling a webhead a loudmouth, he tells our hero to have his fun while he can because he's not gonna feel like laughing for long before hitting the floor and striking Spidey in the gut with his tail, sending the webhead crashing into a bookshelf. Jameson, for his part, is wasting no time. He breaks for the exit, past Betty Brant, 
but he's got to be quicker than that. Scorpion lashes out with his tail again, smashing through a sheer wall as Betty tumbles backward, screaming that Scorpion's tail is deadly and there's no escaping it. Spidey, leapfrogging an overturned filing cabinet to open page 10, thinks he has to get to Scorpion, who has JJ pinned against the doorframe of the bullpen, with Betty in range of the green-clad bruisers swinging battering ram of a tail. Spidey's thinking, I've gotta reach him fast. Another second might be too late. And moving as fast as a man-sized spider can, he lunges at Scorpion, connecting with a right straight punch square on Scorpion's jaw. But Spidey's hit doesn't come clean. As he cracks Scorpion's jaw, Scorpion counterattacks with a swing of his massive tail, connecting with the back of Spider-Man's head. But Spidey knew what he was getting into when he lunged, and thinking he couldn't afford to wait, goes flying towards a wall, stopping himself from smashing into it with his left hand above the damsel in fear in the pink cashmere, Betty Brandt. But she isn't alone. She's got her face buried in her bow, Ned Lee's shoulder, who's just arrived on scene and wrapped his arms around her. Spidey wonders where the man came from as Leeds shouts, Harry Spider-Man, you've got to stop the scorpion. But Leeds isn't done. Betty's still wrapped in his arms. He shouts at Spider-Man that he'll cover Miss Brant. All the webhead has to do is concentrate on the fight. And oh yeah, watch out for Scorpion's tail. Spidey, running along desktop towards Scorpion, looks back at Ned and Betty and spills salt all over the room. Is he thinking what I'm thinking? What oyster shells used to pave Pearl Street? Wait, what? Of course he's thinking what I'm thinking. Brother, first he muscles in on my girl, and now he's giving me advice on how to protect myself. Yeesh. Filled with burning rage, the masked teenager attempts a rash, headlong attack. Dot, dot, dot. Why is there no exclamation point there? Spidey, fist clenched, thinks this moment of Leeds playing hero is all the Scorpion's fault, and he's going to pulverize the green bruiser, racing towards him. But alas... The Scorpion has other ideas. And in a great bit of comedic visual storytelling, Spidey flies feet overhead, slamming into the stage left border of the final panel with a loud wham right past Betty and Nettie. Still hugging his girl Friday, Ned jerks his head back with a stern look on his face shouting, I told you to watch out for his tail. Spidey, staring at him, has his response come out in an upside down caption box. Aw, oh, shut up. In this, our panel of the week. Then, throwing caution to the wind, the wonderful web spinner hurdles toward the scorpion at top speed. Ned shouts for Betty not to worry because he's going to keep her safe. And Spidey is moving. He's thinking, one swipe with his tail can be deadly. He's got to be stopped before someone gets in his way. Spidey leapfrogs the filing cabinet once more towards the man with the vicious right hand. Scorpion is just smashed through another desk with a whip of his tail aimed at JJ's back, shouting that even Spider-Man can't save the miserable magnate. JJ, for his part, is running away with both his arms flailing like he's olive oil in an old Popeye cartoon, shouting that Scorpion shouldn't be going after him with Spidey right behind them. He is shameless, and Scorpion knows it. Swiping at JJ once more with his tail, he shouts that the man will throw anyone in his way to save himself. JJ, as he often does when his life is on the line, gets honest. He shouts, but it's Spider-Man's job to fight killers like you. Scorpion doesn't care. He replies that if the webhead knows what's good for him, he'll resign real quick. Before Spidey leaps across the room with all the agility he has, clubbing Scorpion with another right hand. It's a beautiful panel. Spidey speed sending both men flying horizontally. Spidey shouting the whole time. If I knew it was good for me, I wouldn't be here in the first place, mister. This is for frightening Betty Brant, you think? Call my man a fink. You do not get to scare his girl Friday and get away with it. Jameson, cowering in the foreground, his face covered in his hands, has become a Spidey cheerleader. He's screaming, hit him again, harder, harder. But the very fit of sheer rage, which makes him fight like a demon, also makes Spider-Man unusually careless. Dot, dot, dot. Where's the exclamation point? And the caption box is right. Spidey throws a wild roundhouse off balance without either foot touching the floor for support. But Scorpy gets dodgy, gets slow, and slams his tail into Spidey's gut. Pressing his advantage, Scorpy goes Jerome Avenue football. Translation? High low! Sweeping Spidey's legs with his tail and knocking the webhead backwards with a haymaker of his own, shouting. Ha! Didn't expect me to trip you with my tail, huh? Sweet dreams, webhead. It's time for your beauty nap. You can sure use one. Spidey's off his feet, both arms up, shouting, Ugh! 
his chin now in the worst position you want to be in in a fight. On 12, he smashes into a desk, his body destroying it, while JJ's cheers turn to jeers immediately. You overrated clown! You bumbling incompetent! He's making you look like a bum! Spidey tells the miserable magnate to relax because he's not hurt, and JJ replies, Who cares about you? That furniture set me back a fortune! Translation? I don't care if you get hurt, kid. This furniture ain't from Ikea. Then, moving almost faster than the eye can follow, Spidey resumes his pounding attack in his own unexpected, dazzling manner. Dot, 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 exclamation point. Spidey goes classic and pushing off of the shattered table, tucking his legs, wrapping his arms around them, rolls past JJ towards the scorpion, bowling the villain over and giving the miserable magnate the chance to escape. But at this moment, the police detail assigned to protect Jameson, that's Joe, that's Tomas, that's Ike, they race into the bullpen, guns drawn, ready to make a mess. JJ shouts that they've arrived just in time and orders them to shoot both the masked men dead. Tomas and Ike take aim, but Joe screams, No, hold your fire. Jameson's in no immediate danger. Meanwhile, Scorpion's on his knees swinging his tail behind him at a leaping Spidey. And if there's one thing Scorpion knows, a vicious right hand won't stop a bullet from the 616's superhuman task force. Shouting that he won't be tossed back into stir, that's prison, again, and makes for the closest window immediately. But this fight isn't done. Spidey's on his tail, figuratively, they both hit the sheer outside wall of the building in the next panel and begin climbing. Spidey shouts, I've got news for you, Scorpion. When I'm through with you, you wish you were back in your nice cozy cell. Scorpion's like, yeah, whatever. As soon as I'm out of the range of their bullets, I'm going to put you under the ground. And of course, with the danger gone, in the final panel, JJ's regained all of his bluster. Poking his head and a raging fist out of the window, he calls the men yellow and shouts for them to come back because he's not through with them. Tomas from off panel says JJ's mighty brave today. Joe, behind the miserable magnate, replies, Sure, since we got here. With a giant smile on his face, like we don't believe you, JJ. The police exit the scene and JJ is standing in the mess of his bullpen now, arms wide to open 13. There are chunks missing from the walls, overturned chairs, every desk and table is destroyed. The golden liability has just raised the insurance rate of 39th Street, 2nd Avenue, at least... 300%. JJ shouting that the furniture that isn't destroyed is cracked and scarred, but he's thinking, Nobody has to know that I've been wanting to get rid of this old junk for years. Now the insurance will pay for a whole new setup. Miserable. Ned, still clutching Betty in the next panel, says she's shaken up, so he's going to take her home. JJ's like, fine. He's not going to expect her to work after the chaos that just went down, so she can go home without pay for the missing time, of course. Of course. Ned thinks no wonder they say JJ's all heart and escorts Betty out, telling her everything's okay now. She can relax because Spider-Man and Scorpion are gone. But Betty doesn't have beef with Spider-Man. Stop trying to play hero, Ned. You were just standing there barking orders. You got no hands team. But doesn't he? He has no hands team. Back to JJ let Betty and Ned go, but everyone else? What are you all standing around for? Get to work. Get to work. And have one of our staff photographers come up here immediately. As he shouts this, he thinks he's got a great idea. His great idea? JJ has his photographers take a picture of him in the wreckage of his bullpen, shouting that he wants tons of photos in the ruins of battle. He goes on to create a completely false headline about how he, fearless and courageous, saved everyone else from deadly costume killers. He screams that he'll be a hero. And so, dot, dot, dot. This man has jumped out of the window and into the greatest river that flows through men's minds, Denial. But the river runs dry quickly as a couple of bullpen staffers walk past in conversation. What do you think will happen if the Scorpion defeats Spider-Man? He'll probably return and attack Jameson again. JJ thinks that he never thought of that, and it may just be time for him to take a long trip. I hear Egypt's beautiful this time of year, JJ. Meanwhile, high above the city's towering rooftops, the one man whom Jameson hates the most in all the world battles valiantly against the deadly, merciless Scorpion. Dot 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 and if spidey is not clocked in he and scorpio are battling on a thin brown ledge barely wide enough for them to stand on with the east river because it's always the east river in the background i mean at least scorpion's standing on the ledge spidey's two feet off of it dodging a downward strike from the battering ram that is scorpion's tail shouting at the villain that after today scorpion's gonna have to find another sparring partner scorpion replies it'll be a pleasure once i finish you out Ooh. 
but he doesn't get to finish his sentence because Spidey decks him square in the mouth. Hold that, shut up. They leap to a water tower and Spidey is talking his smack, telling Scorpy he doesn't care about his plans because the King of Swing from Forest Hills, Queens has his own. Scorpion swings that battering ram again, shouting that Spidey isn't going to be around long enough to carry out any plans. And Spidey, agility on BYCI, that's best you can imagine, backflips off the water tower, legs ah. wide and says in response, don't bet on it, bump. I'm harder to lose than a bill collector. That's an easy quip for the king of thwip. And Scorpy is pissed. He follows Spidey down onto the rooftop below and returns the jaw punch Spidey gave him in the first panel of this page, saying he's gonna knock our hero into the middle of next week. And if you can, take a look at this punch. This is ASM number 30. This is page 14. This is panel number three. He's hit the golden liability so hard, Spidey's right foot has kicked out in front of him and he's off his feet, jaw north, again. But Spidey eats those. Falling backwards, he says that this is good, that he's got TV shows he's dying to see. And I'm guessing it's the Beverly Hillbillies with his darling Aunt May. But he's gotta survive this fight first. He lands on his feet and into the final panel in time to get dodgy as the scorpion swings that tail again. Spidey has got to get rid of this tail. The last fight, Scorpion didn't use it with nearly this much deadly accuracy. Half the time he swung it in this issue, he's connected. But I digress. Scorpion asked the webhead what's the holdup? That anybody else would have already fallen on their face. But the King of Swing has other plans. And ruin this handsome profile of mine? Forget it. Besides, it's time for me to get up at bat now. Now batting, number one, from Forest Hills, Queens. The Golden Liability, Spider-Man. And on 15, Spidey goes web ball crazy. He spins one in each hand in a golden rod negative space while Scorpion screams from off panel. You didn't expect to beat the Scorpion with a couple of web yo-yos, do you? Spidey says, hold on. If you think I can't stop you, let me make a few more and dives into his Birkin. And he does. In the next panel, we're staring at Spidey over Scorpion's shoulder and the kid has been going to work in the negative space between panels. He's crafted six bowlers and spinning three over his head with his right hand, advances towards the Scorpion, telling the bruiser to watch the birdie before hurling two at the villain's legs in the next panel faster than Scorpion can move. Scorpion stumbles back into a nearby wall and Spidey lets the rest of the bowlers fly, tangling the man up all in webbing. Four fifths of this man's body covered in webbing. Scorpion stumbles back into a nearby wall and Spidey lets the rest of the bowlers fly. The Spidey gets off. Oh, of course he gets the hit, tangling the villain up in webbing. Spidey presses his advantage, starts talking his smack, saying the Scorpion can't beat him by leaning against the wall that way. But Scorpion's not leaning. He's coiling up that powerful tail to strike and he tells Spidey to stand right there and not move. And Spidey listens. That arrogance. It cost him though, because Scorpion, using his tail as a spring, shoots from the wall and slams all 220 pounds of his body weight into our hero, screaming, happy landings, you fool, knocking Spidey off the roof. But Spidey didn't get the title of most agile for nothing. Didn't you give him that title? Yeah, but it wasn't for nothing. Falling backwards from the roof, Spidey webs the Scorpion's tail and shouting, the same to you, chum. Whither I go, you go. Thanks to my ever-loving webbing. Pulls the scorpion, head over feet, off the roof with him. Scorpion shouts, no! And the two go tumbling. On 16, Spidey webs the head of a gargoyle. And if you're a fan of the Spider-Man animated series, you know that this is probably Spider-Man's stone confidant, Bruce the Gargoyle. Spidey tells Scorpion that he forgot the man can't fly, but says, have no fear, Spidey's here. Still gripping his strand of webbing, wrapping up Scorpion, he wonders aloud how much Ed Sullivan would pay for an act like this. Edward Vincent Sullivan was an American television personality, impresario, sports and entertainment reporter, and syndicated columnist for the New York Daily News and the Chicago Tribune New York News Syndicate. He was the creator and host of the television variety program, The Toast of the Town, which in 1955 was renamed The Ed Sullivan Show. Broadcast from 1948 to 1971, it set a record as the longest running variety show in US broadcast history. Decades before the word influencer, was associated with Instagrams, Twitters, and Facebooks. Ed Sullivan, through his show in newspaper columns, introduced America to the next big thing repeatedly, from rock to jazz to classical to comedians. 
Sullivan almost single-handedly made it acceptable to host black acts. Everyone from legendary dancer Peg Leg Bates to Motown Supremes, who he hosted on his show no less than 17 times. And there's an anecdotal story that Sullivan tried to beat a racist in Cleveland to a pulp after the man told him that he knew Sullivan had to have on the show, but why did he have to put his arm around Bill Bojangles Robinson after the black man was done dancing? Sullivan didn't answer him directly with his words. Of course, he tried to beat the man to a pulp. But he's quoted as saying later in an interview, as a Catholic, it was inevitable that I would despise intolerance because Catholics suffered more than their share of it. As I grew up, the causes of minorities were part and parcel of me. Negroes and Jews were the minority causes closest at hand. I need no urging to take a plunge in and help. Helping because he can. Great power. You already know. He was friends with presidents, had audiences with several popes, and was beloved his entire adult life by the majority of American people. But he also made a lot of bad calls, caving to pressure from his sponsors during the Cold War and anti-communism hysteria of the 1940s and 50s, agreeing not to host Communist Party sympathizers, and in 1963, under pressure from his sponsors, refused to host my personal favorite singer of all time, Bob Dylan, because the great one wanted to sing Talkin' John Birch Paranoid Blues, a song making fun of the ultra-conservative society of the same name. Sullivan also wasn't allowed to host the legendary Ingrid Bergman, who'd been ousted from Hollywood royalty after having an affair with a married director being married herself. Sullivan thought she'd be forgiven by the public, but his sponsors wouldn't have it. Sullivan was right, though. Bergman won her second Oscar and the love of her fans back. For the most part, however, Sullivan was a person who saw people and gave proof to Shakespeare's quote that the whole world's a stage and took it one step further with the idea that all people were worthy of that stage's spotlight. In 1985, 11 years after his death, Sullivan was inducted into the Television Academy Hall of Fame. I personally think he deserved more. Back to. So Spidey's wondering if Sully will cut a check for him, while the Scorpion, four-fifths of his body covered in webbing, as villains often do when those turn tables, is in full-on panic. Get down from here before we kill! Do something, you lunatic! If this blasted hunk of webbing should break! And Spidey's wholly offended. Bite your tongue, Scorp! My webbing's never broken yet! Although there's always a first time. Scorpion says if he ever gets out of this, Spider-Man won't last 10 minutes. I'd say he's floating down the Nile, but Spidey's dragged the man's body through the air from the east of the city towards the Hudson River. He swung this man the width of the city and shouting, In that case, I'd better stop handling you with kid gloves. I'm beginning to suspect that you don't want to be friends. With those taunting words, the amazing Spider-Man releases his life-saving strand of web as the two figures go hurtling through the air over the Hudson River. Dot, dot, dot. Exclamation point. And then, like two careening human meteors, the two super-powered antagonists plummet into the water below. Dot, dot, dot. Exclamation point. This opened 17, but it may not have been the smartest move for Spider-Man. In the water, Scorpion frees himself from the webbing and goes right after Spidey to make good on his 10 minute promise. We're in the action shot of the cover now, Scorpion swinging his battering ramp, but Spidey has no fear. Even in the water, my natural agility makes it easy to dodge his pounding tail. Spinning upside down beneath the Hudson, he thinks that while the Scorpion's thrashing, he's going to reload his web shooters and does. Engineer that he is, of course he's made his webbing waterproof and in a beautiful panel of his hands thinks, look, look, originally made it waterproof. Everything's set now. Here's where old Spidey goes to work to squash a scorpion. The title told us never step on one. Spidey's gonna squash it completely. Letting loose with both shooters into the water, wrapping the scorpion up again. His web shooters are working overtime in this one. On 18, Spidey breaks all the rules of human physiology and starts talking smack beneath the waves of the Hudson River like he's Namor the Submariner. Oh, didn't I tell you? You're not gonna get your hands on me. This comic book wizardry aside, Spidey's thinking Scorpion can't hold his breath as long as he can, and he stays beneath the waves with the villain until the Scorpion passes out. In the next panel, Spidey is hunched over a dock of the Hudson, water dripping from him, puddling beneath his feet, and he is dragging the man from the river like so much fish quipping. I hope this is the fishing season around here. Otherwise, I might have to throw you back in. Hmm. Something tells me my little witticisms are wasted on you right now. He webs Scorpion up onto the side of the pier and leaps onto a sheer wall, saying that he hopes they give the villain his old cell back so he feels right at home again as Joe and Tomas rush up with perfect comic timing. Tomas screaming for Joe to send for the paddy wagon. This fight is over. 
Moments later, we find the goldenrod kid, Peter Parker, sitting on a skylight of a nearby rooftop, his spidey red and blues draped on a wire nearby, as he rings out a piece of his costume, wearing a t-shirt and his SJBs. And he's monologuing something fierce. Aunt May is always afraid I'll catch my death of cold, so I'd better dry out my costume. Then, I'll go see how things are shaping up at Jonah's office, and how Betty is feeling now. I sure wish these duds were wash and wear. Thus, a short time later, dot, dot, dot. His clothes dry, Pete and his goldenrod Parker heads back into the Daily Bugle, where he runs into JJ, who's smiling with all his teeth, holding a late edition of the Daily Bugle. And JJ is drowning in denial now. Where'd you run off to, Parker? You missed a chance to photograph me in action, heroically defeating Spider-Man and the Scorpion. Pete thinks, wow, but lets it go, asking where Betty is. JJ says, still cheesing, that Ned Leeds took her home. On 19, JJ isn't worried about Betty, he tells Pete to listen to the Bugle's latest headline. Jonah Jameson proved himself to be as brave as he is handsome. And Pete scowling, already pissed that Betty's gone, he asks, who wrote that about you? JJ, eyes closed, head thrown back, says he did because he doesn't believe in false modesty. Continuing into the next panel, he says that the best thing about being a publisher, he can write whatever he wants about himself. Pete, done with this one-man circle jerk, walks away thinking he's going to call Betty. And he does. In the next panel, we see him in a green phone booth, phone pressed against his right ear. But there's no answer. Pete, dejected, thinks. I wonder if she went anywhere with Ned Lee. I sure wish he was just a creep. So I could really dislike him. So he knows Ned's a good guy, which makes him losing his time with Betty even worse. What's he going to do, though? He hangs up. Finally, happy over his victorious battle with the Scorpion, but frustrated and puzzled by his setback with Betty Brandt, Peter Parker returns to the modest home in Forest Hills, which he shares with his doting Aunt May. Aunt May in a sky blue dress and white apron is dusting the dresser near the front door as the goldenrod kid walks in and spotting him, ask if he was out for a little walk. Pete's been gone all day, May. And he's as confused as I am. He's like, what, huh? Yeah, yeah, sure, I was. Skywalking. I bet that's what he's thinking. May smiles at him saying that's nice, but doting as she is, goes on to say that Pete shouldn't overdo it and rest every few blocks. Her smile makes him smile and he says, I try not to overtax myself, Aunt May, before thinking he'd better give Betty a ring again. He calls her, someone picks up, and he gets right to business. Hi, Betty, this is Peter. I was wondering how you... Huh? What? Who? Huh? Betty has not answered the phone. Who has? This is Ned Leeds, Parker. Betty can't come to the phone right now. In the final panel, Ned sitting in the foreground, head lowered, phone pressed against his left ear as a light brown haired woman sits in a chair in the center of the panel in front of Betty Brant, who is laying on her couch with a towel on her forehead. The damsel is really in distress. Ned says that Betty just came from the hospital and a friend's going to stay with her tonight. Betty wonders who's on the phone, but her friend tells her not to worry, that whoever it is can't be important and a doctor ordered her to rest. What do you mean can't be important? Give that woman the phone. But Ned doesn't. On 20, we're watching Pete now. He lowers his head dejectedly as Ned tells him that Betty will be okay by morning and he'll tell Pete she called. Pete replies, yeah, do that little thing. And as emo as they come, he hangs up the phone in the next panel, bracing his fist on the table where it's sitting. He says, tell her I called. He already hung up. This kid is so morose. He's losing his lady because he's never there when she needs him, at least not as the goldenrod kid. It feels like the death rattle of his relationship with Betty Brant has begun. And I feel for you, Pete, I do. I've lost my share of great women by being everything except there when they need me. But we gotta push forward, and you're not alone. Meanwhile, in the kitchen, dot, dot, dot. May is in the kitchen, reaching into the cupboard, monologuing about her nephew, saying the kid looks peaked and what he needs is a tonic. She says she's gonna mix him one before stars dance in front of her eyes. She grimaces, says the world spinning and falls to her knees, her left hand bracing on the counter, the glass falling from her grip and crashing beside her. She says, oh, I felt so dizzy for a second. I, I thought I was going to faint. Of course, Pete walks in at this moment, concern etched in his words. What is it, Aunt May? What's wrong? May's smile hops back onto her face immediately. And lifting the glass, she tells Pete that nothing's wrong. She just dropped the glass. Lying. And even if that was what really happened, Pete should have been a little more suspicious. Why would she get down on her knees to pick up glass when there's glass on the floor? 
But Pete doesn't ask those questions. He asks instead if she's sure. But she shoots him away, telling him she needs to start dinner, thinking that she doesn't want to worry him because it was probably nothing serious. In the final panel, Pete walks out of the kitchen, left hand in pocket, as May watches him thinking. It mustn't be anything serious. For if something should happen to me, then who would look after that poor, lonely boy? The issue ends with a caption box. And so, we leave our wondrous web spinner and his gentle loving aunt for the time being. Next issue, poor Peter will be plagued by problems from all sides. But it won't be as difficult as it sounds if you'll be there to share them with him. The end. And we're out. The SNS and S connection came into this one with both barrels raised and started firing wildly, hitting so many different threads that will lead into some of the best Spider-Man stories of all time. Ned leads, he's back. Pete and Betty on the rocks. JJ not paying parking meters. And scariest of all, Aunt May is experiencing dizzy spells she won't tell our friend about. If you can, sit down with this issue and take in the artwork. I know I gush often, but pacing can make or break a comic book, and we've entered the meat of Steve Ditko and Stan Lee's best work as a tandem. I'm super excited for what's next. And what's next? ASM number 30, The Claws of the Cat, where we get a brand new Spider-Man villain named, you guessed it, The Cat. We've got the return of a couple of people missing this issue, more light shed on May's health, and a surprise announcement from Betty Brant that turns my friend Pete's life upside down. That's the main episode this week. And that's true. That's the main episode. But there is more Me and My Friend Pete available for your listening pleasure right now. If you support this show on Patreon.com slash HSPP, patrons get a bonus show every week where I run through comic books from all over the multiverse of comics, past and present, from Marvel to DC to all points in between. This week, we're running through Spider-Man Breakout. Spidey's first adventure after becoming an official member for the first time of Earth's mightiest heroes, the Avengers. But the solo slinger ain't used to working with a team, so he doesn't, much to his detriment, because he's taking on one of the most deadly teams in the Marvel Universe, the UFOs. If we've got comics, we've got history, and I'll be your guy through it all. Join us. This podcast is completely listener supported, and your support keeps this crazy train on the tracks. I'm truly grateful you keep coming back and more grateful you allow me to be the conductor. Thank you so much for listening. And as always, a special thanks to the home team, Parker's 11. Sign up now, vote on bonus episodes, make it 12. You won't regret it. You got questions? Send them to me and my friend Pete at gmail.com and I'll go digging for the answers. Follow us on Instagram at MNMFP underscore podcast. All that said, that's all that said. Please like, please comment, please share, please take care, please think of the world and be true to yourself. And remember, with great power, you know the rest. Make sure you're being responsible. I'm out of here.